I'm James Just, and this is Libertarian Counterpoint. With me today is our final conversation with Kalish Mero, who's running for City Council of Hanford, and Mayor, who's Mayor. Good, wow, <laughs> Nicholas Wildstar, who's running, for, there. You're right. who's running for Mayor of California. Mayor Wildstar, we'll just call you that now. There you go. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, I'm lucky I didn't call you Governor Wildstar because that's how I used right. to refer to you for the longest time. Um, <laughs> Kalish, why don't we sit here and have a short conversation about what it's like to want to make the decision to run for office? I know there's lots of libertarians, you know, have sit there and consider running for office, but what's kind of it's like to have a short conversation? What's it like to kind of go through that process? I don't know. It's like just jumping off the deep end, going, "Okay, I guess I'm going to do this." <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, for me, when I when I first ran in 2016, uh, it really just came about where th we had. The incumbent at the time, he was deciding not to run again. Um, he, I was in his district, and he was out there looking for other people that were going to run. And you know, I'd been so much involved with the community and already, you know, kind of being vocal with our city council. I said, "Sure, why, why not?" Well, once he announced that he made it public that he wasn't going to run again, three more people jumped in. <laughs> So, um, so anyway, after I lost that one, I, I knew that if, if I ran again, I was going to run a much different campaign, mm -hmm. be a lot more aggressive, start early, get my name out there a lot more. You know, in the meantime, I had already been building up some of the name recognition through activism and whatnot and community involvement. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, just being, have a campaign manager, have funding, all the things. So mm -hmm. we could run that for yeah. Run a serious campaign. So, but so that first campaign, it, it helped you learn a lot. So, you, so when you're much absolutely. better prepared for that second one. Oh yeah, absolutely. It, uh, it, you know, it kind of, I got to know what all my mistakes were. You know, maybe not start canvassing after all of the mail-in ballots goes out. You know, <laughs> <laughs> start doing that beforehand. <laughs> I was in a weird uh, situation though because my husband's military and he was out of town a lot, getting ready for a deployment and, and things like that. So um, there really just wasn't a lot of time. I had, was running a business, two small children. I mean, I'm walking down the sidewalk with my kids in a double stroller. They're still really young at that time, so I can go canvas. <laughs> yes, I just, just doing what you can. There's this whole new generation of libertarian women who just astound me because I had to wait till my kids were grown before I could get involved because simply because it was too cumbersome. Mm -hmm. And so you've all these young, young women who are out there. There's a handful of them, and mm -hmm. they're just they're just so impressive to me. It's just so impressive. I'm sitting here watching you yeah. guys go out and do all this with, while raising your young children and raising your young families, and I'm going, I couldn't do it. You know, it's something I was not able to do. My kids were raised, you know, and when I decided a couple of years ago, I did a, I was part of the Ted Brown Brigade. You know, if, mm -hmm. I don't know you guys know about the Ted Brown Brigade, is, is when actually all the candidates have kind of decided and you've got the unopposed, right. people with unopposed, Ted Brown calls you up and says, hey, we've got this opportunity. <laughs> right. You guys want to run for office? Uh, all right, I'll think about it. Mm -hmm. So I go and I talk to my family. What do you guys think? And, you know, and what do you guys think? You know, it's a, while it's not likely, there's a possibility that, you know, media can blow up. You know, you just want to go through all the things and right. make sure all the family is known. And so, if you, you know, whatever. And you go through all that kind of family stuff. For yeah. me, that's what it was my focus was. My focus right. was on, okay, is the, fam is the whole family going to be ready for me running for right. office? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I, uh, you know, I'm kind of touching on what you asked before about, you know, libertarians wanting to start running. Um, we just had a, a meeting, kind of like a subgroup of the candidate support committee that we have, um, where we're trying to, not trying to, we're going to be launching uh, Operation First Step. So basically reaching out, we're, we're researching the different counties and seeing what is available city council and below that. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at, you know, um, water boards and um, school boards and the, the ones that uh, you, you know, know fire aren't, district boards all the yeah, various all those everywhere. different ones you know there's so <laughs> many different ones which I you know I never even thought of really yeah. uh, beforehand but there's so many that are out there and these are obtainable spots and a lot of times too these boards are sitting empty mm -hmm. so if we have anybody like that's out there that you know that's really interested in wanting to run a campaign or something but it, and really wants to make a difference both in their community and for the Libertarian Party you know they 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 need to look into these other opportunities. Start thinking outside the box, you know, and start building up that resume. Well, if, well that's a campaign committee. I'll let you guys get if, mm -hmm. what from what those of us would need. A nice little checklist. The ten right. blank checklist is so if you're running for office, here's what you do. Here's your ten, the five first things, the ten first things that you do. You go to this <laughs> yeah. the, the county clerk and whatever it is. Right. If that kind of thing would be nice because. Mm -hmm. 
we're having to reinvent that essentially every time is kind of a pain. Yeah, and I think that now, uh, you know, the, the state party has been looking so different from what it used to here in California. Uh, we've, we're, we've gotten a lot more organized. We've got a lot more funding coming in, uh, being a lot more serious about these these sorts of things. And um, like our candidate, candidate support committee um, are, is a great resource for that, as well as, you know, Open Source Liberty. I believe they're helping, you know, yeah. they've helped me, helped me out with my campaign and helping out Multiple all Star as well, too. Yeah. Yeah. So, they, you know, they're great resources for anybody. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm a part of mm -hmm. Open Source Liberty myself. Right. I, yeah. I, I, I do some help, and they're going to offer me some help if I get past my whole signature thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Nicholas, why don't we talk to you, someone who's run multiple times. What might you want to say to somebody who's sitting at home, you know, <laughs> listening to us talk and say, you know, I might want to get involved, you know, but the toxic atmosphere is so toxic. You know, how do you go get involved with that without becoming part of that? Well, that's actually why you're needed. <laughs> so you can, you know, clean up the swamp, uh, drain the swamp, as Trump said. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we need good people in office. And that's what's sad about our leadership is we're expecting them to be those good people that they are promoting themselves to be on the campaign trail. I myself, I was one of those people to where I saw it on TV and this political circus. And, you know, um, of course, once they get out in office, become dis disheartened by their performance. So uh, let that frustration add to your motivation to run for office, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, there may not be any structure there, especially if you're running as a libertarian, you know? <laughs> uh, uh, it, unfortunately, with the Republican and Democratic Party, they're well-oiled machines. So all you gotta do is just raise your hand you know, and they'll immediately groom you to be this candidate right. that they need you to be. Um, however, again, with the Libertarian Party, because that structure isn't there, you kind of have to create it as you go, you know? And um, I, I think that's kind of the best part about running as a Libertarian is you kind of get a chance to do your own thing. I mean, the first time that I ran um, for governor uh, was in 2014 as an independent. Now, um, a lot of people may say, you know, that's a bit impractical for you to run for such an office for your first time running, but there was no candidate for Libertarian on the ballot in 2014. So running as um, uh, an advocate of the party that you like or want to represent helps with presence. And the Libertarian Party, unfortunately, doesn't recognize that much. If they did, they would probably put more resources into those candidates such as myself to do aim for executive positions because it does give us an opportunity to be heard. So where I ran as an independent in 2014 and got 12 votes, mm -hmm. imagine if I had ran as a libertarian. You know, the Peace and Freedom uh, Party and the Green Party had their candidates and there was some independents there as, as well. Like I said, myself as a write-in candidate got 12 votes. Then when I ran as a libertarian in 2018, I got nearly 12,000 votes. You see, so had I ran in 2014 as a libertarian, probably, probably would have got that 12,000 then, and then in 2018, got even more, you see? So it's all about running for the race that you believe that you can do. You know, you gotta know your strengths and um, know the um, limitations of them. You know? Yeah, I think like you know, for up ticket candidates, you know, it's a great opportunity to be the, that spokesperson for the the party. Um, you know, you get you have so many more opportunities to get get your voice heard out there, and yeah, that's absolutely. definitely um, definitely a a tool for us. Well, I'm a firm believer in that. We actually need to do all of it. We yeah. need to get to the the blow up boards, the small boards that kind of nobody knows. We need the the voices of the people who can go up there and, and argue for the big positions that are not likely to win, but are willing to go through the process and willing right. to take the arrows. Mm -hmm. You know, we we need all of that. And so, if you're sitting at home and you're considering it, well, talk to your local libertarian official. Talk to find somebody to talk to, and walk work yourself through it. Uh, that's what I Absolutely. encourage you to do. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. maybe you don't have to make the decision. Work yourself through it. Maybe take a couple years. You don't have to make the decision in a day or a month or a week. You can plan it for 2024. Right. You know, this is not this is not something that is so immediate a need. It's a long-term thing that we're trying to build, right? We're all trying to build something for long-term. We, we want our future generations to benefit from our hard work. So actually future generations from benefiting from hard work. Let's talk about education. You've got to homeschool your kids if I, if I kind of, mm -hmm. I, that's a, oh, cool. yeah. I think that, that's a growing movement. Right? The unschooling movement is kind of a growing movement. The yeah. education system is becoming an indoctrination movement, I guess is one way a lot of people call it. It's, you know, I, 
try to stay away from hyperbole, but it's almost hard to these days. Right. Um, yeah, we we made that decision really early on for our kids to uh, to do homeschooling. It, it first started out kind of as like a paranoia, you know, you start hearing more and more about school shootings and whatnot. And, and of course, you know, when you've got your children, you, you it's literally watching your heart walk around outside your body. It's scary. Um, but then beyond that, just knowing that, you know, California's got some of the worst education or is education in California is some of the worst in the nation. Um, and then where we live, too, it's I think it's one of the worst in the nation just in our town. Um, so just not know, knowing that there weren't very many good opportunities for our kids. Um, so anyway, we, we put them in preschool earlier on just so they can get kind of that interaction, a little bit of structure. And I think that was good for them. Uh, and then from kindergarten on, we've homeschooled them. And now, you know, like you, you're talking about unschooling, it was, it was a really new concept for me about a year or so ago. And we've kind of been slowly transitioning to that because it's really hard to just like let go of that. We had our kids with a, um, uh, they were doing a, um, like a homeschool program. Uh, but it was so full of like all these worksheets and like they just were hating it. And I could see where in certain areas they were killing some of the creativity too. Um, and we just threw our hands up and said, you know what, no, we've got to do something different. And then kind of like unschooling says that you have to kind of go through this de-schooling process. You just let the kids do whatever they want for a few months. Like, and everybody just decompresses for a while. Um, and so we kind of unintentionally did that. We, we didn't know what we were going to do, what, what, what our structure was going to be, our curriculum, what have you. Uh, and, you know, then they just started learning things on their own. You know, mm -hmm. we, we finally got the, uh, uh, them like just like little fire, Kindle fires or whatever uh, to play on. We put some learning apps and, and stuff on them. Uh, and they were really excited about learning and playing right. those games. And now my, my six-year-old who could barely, you know, do math on his counting his fingers is starting to figure out multiplication <laughs> problems and I'm just floored. And so it's just really made me a believer that yes, like children can teach themselves, you know, get the, you still have to facilitate them, mm -hmm. you know, and I, you still kind of encourage them too, like, hey, you guys aren't really doing anything. How about you go play that new game I got <laughs> you and learn some letters? Okay, mom, you know, yeah, but, and they're really happy with that. And how do we take some of these lessons that we've learned and, and put them into the low income neighborhoods of Fresno or, or my stuff? Because that's kind of what, where the next goal is, is, you know, we got parents who are too busy, you know, two parents are working right. or, or don't have the resources. Or maybe they're just not capable. You know, not everybody's capable of doing that. Right. And so how do we get those people to get them in the better education, that, the type of more free education where children are more free to learn on their own? How do we Absolutely. do that in Fresno? I think more so it has to do with the lack of funding, um, especially in Fresno that seems to get the butt end of it, you know. Uh, and, of course, you have those city officials that mismanage funding and um, corrupt corrupt individuals, you know, taking the money, embezzling, etc. So I would say, if anything, um, because unfortunately my, you know, powers as mayor would be limited with regards to what I'd be able to do with the educational system. But because of that bully pulpit, I would have a larger stage uh, to, you know, speak on behalf of what the people of community of the community want from their school board officials and you know of course with like what I said with the funding because I am in charge of the budget you know I'd be able to make sure that those underdeveloped communities that feel like they they're not getting enough um, you know funding in their neighborhoods actually get money to make their school system better um, investing into after school programs that I would be able to do you know in school to work programs and job training programs you know to help that transition from, you know, going into a classroom into the workplace, you know? So I think that's equally as important as, you right. know, preparing our children for what's next, you know, to come. And well, so much of our education money is now controlled from either Sacramento or Washington, D.C. Right. Even the local school boards essentially don't have much control. Right. And so when a, a city council member or a mayor, you know, you actually have to work outside right. the education system to figure out how to do this thing. And right. that's kind yeah. of, it, it's an extra challenge. Well, uh, you know, and, um, 
there, because of the movement, uh, there is becoming more and more co-ops and resource centers are popping up. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that as, uh, you know, somebody in a mayoral position, city council position, we can help facilitate those facilities <laughs> from being created. That's what looking at doing. Right. Exactly. Looking at the different ordinances, you know, what do you need, um, especially like in certain areas, we've got one side of our town that's low income and another side that's being that's a lot more prosperous if we can get one of these resource centers put a little bit either in the middle or more towards that side of town mm -hmm. uh giving them an opportunity where it's like different kind of education you know exactly. you've got a crappy -ish school in your area um you've well, got like this you resource said, center you can prop up the tablets and the people are pretty much learning for themselves they are know? and yeah it's been amazing seeing uh you know i've been doing a lot more research on it and we're, we're seeing like these unschool resource centers or co-op or whatnot and uh you know unfortunately they can be a little expensive they're still cheaper than your public school system which i think we're paying twelve thousand dollars a year like that, yeah. mm -hmm. you're spending four thousand dollars a year on exactly. your kid at like one of these resource centers however this is coming directly out of your pocket on top of already being taxed for the public school system right. um but you know if like if you're able to do some fundraisers or have families sponsor another family too that can afford it you know i think that there's some other options but just being able to facilitate these other organizations from popping up would be a start all right well i'm going to throw you guys under the bus here for a minute we've been had nice easy conversations today so Okay, we're going to talk about the concept of my body, my choice. All right. With abortion That'd restrictions, kind of going restrictions. It's a, I, for me, it's the, the abortion restrictions that are sweeping the nation and the mandatory vaccinations are mm -hmm. actually the same argument. Yeah. You're, the, you've some, fundamentally, the people, well, in the, drug use. The people in the government mm -hmm. have decided that they right. get to control what goes on inside your body. And it doesn't surprise me that after mandatory vaccinations, the very next step was now we're having abortion restrictions. Right. And so what's kind of your feelings on this? Um, yeah, I think that we've definitely been on a slippery slope. And, you know, like you're pointing out too, like, you know, drug use as well. You know, there's all these different things where they have been restricting what we can do with our own bodies. Um, the, you know, when it comes to abortion, you know, I think that it's just not a very black and white. There's a lot of gray area. Each case can be very different. Um, you know, I don't agree with it being a, you know, a means of birth control. But, you know, it's just such like... There's so many but, but then. But, uh. yeah, it's, well, it's a, such a multifaceted issue, and we don't right. actually have that discussion. We have it as a blank, black and white discussion. Right. And rather than, you know, it's, there's a vast difference between someone who is pregnant through, say, violence and someone mm -hmm. who is pregnant because they're, you know, out having fun all the time. And, you know, which I don't have a problem with, but you guys should take responsibility for that. But I also don't have the right to ask the question. You know, right. why is someone having a, I don't have the right to ask because I, the question is, it might be the, you know, I don't have the right to ask why. Mm -hmm. And so society doesn't have the right to ask why. So for me, it's okay, it's my job to work, find other ways rather than the law to right. reduce abortions. If I don't like abortions, it's on me to use uh, different tactics. And the same way, if I like vaccinations, it's up for me to find some other way than to force people to come through yeah. and, and, and it's vaccination because that actually scares me because the, mm -hmm. the government having control of your body whether it's vaccinations or abortion it's the government well that's the problem is right. we've given them too much authority to govern us mm -hmm. you know they've pretty much codified our actions and behaviors and told us what's acceptable and what isn't and to me all of these issues shouldn't even be up for discussion in the po uh, political arena right. i mean as mayor that's what i'm going to be refusing to do is deal with these sort of petty issues because it, your body is your property and our government just needs to respect it that simply put i mean um no matter what you're putting in your body i mean with my wife when she was pregnant and you know um going through birth because she was refusing certain medications that the doctors was were trying to give her to speed the birth along you know <laughs> it, it seemed to uh, complicate things even further and you know then mm -hmm. they had to sign off uh, permission slips and waivers and you know all of this uh, bureaucracy just for us choosing to be the parents that we wanted to be you know and um, we shouldn't have every facet of our lives being dictated so much by government nor should we be expecting it yeah, I think that's the major problem. There's far right. too many people expecting government to sit here and tell you what to do. Right. Tell mm -hmm. us what to do. How to be good people. Yeah. You we, know? We, like the government knows how to be a good exactly. person. Exactly. They're still <laughs> people themselves, you know? <laughs> I mean, the history of government is not, uh, let's shall we say, a Disney movie. 
right? It's it's a horror movie, the history mm -hmm. of government. All, even our government, even the best governments is not pleasant, right? No. If you go through the history, it's a history of abuse and, and corruption and and forcing people to behave in ways they don't want to, to be. And so it's it's just a very bizarre uh, time of, of we're living in where mm -hmm. people who go to vaccinations, like I'm not anti-vaccinations, but yet people call me anti-vax because I don't support mandatory so well, vaccinations. If you, if you question it, <laughs> yes. you then become anti-vax. Yeah, I'm not anti-vax either. I'm pro-safe vaccinations. Yeah, I, but even because I question the norm, I would get lumped into the anti-vax right. yeah. category. And I'm just simply pro-choice. I feel <laughs> right? like as a parent, you should choose to vaccinate but your children. But you're anti-vax now. Yeah, yeah. But now you're anti that, I'm anti-vax. <laughs> you know, if I want to say no, I shouldn't be able to say no. I shouldn't be forced by the government to comply. I'm right. a believer in one at a time. You go and you get, you know, personally, you give the vaccinations one at a time because yeah. that's the way they're tested. And so if that's the way they're tested, that's the way they should be given. And I'm perfectly fine with that. And in one of my I'm libertarian positions, I'm actually willing to have the state subsidize vaccinations for anybody who wants one. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm actually nowhere near anti-vaccinations, but there's no way you would ever get me to agree that you have to force someone right. to, to inject a foreign substance. Well, Especially if it's my choice. I'm forcing my choice on you. Right. There's got to be something fundamentally wrong with that. And so in that there's that whole argument of, uh, oh, but, you know, if you infect other people, I mean, besides the fact, well, I have to be infected first before I can actually infect you. But, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. if you infect other people, though, then you're at, at fault. And it's like, but there's risk that are involved with uh, with vaccinations. Absolutely. You know, if you're cold, you can't set me on fire to keep you warm. You know? <laughs> yeah, right. But there's also no natural right to not get sick. Right. And yeah, so, I have a natural right to not get hit by a drunk driver, but I don't have a natural right to not, right. Get, to not get a cold. <laughs> right. Well, and so for me, I, you know, I was just that, that blind sheeple, just, okay, well, CDC says we do this, and all these things say it's great, and we should do it. It wasn't until the mandate started coming up that, like, mm. the warning bells started going off. I started doing more research on it and realized how imperfect of a system we are. Right. We've got the one-size-fits-all. And then it, it made me think about my own childhood illnesses. I had two autoimmune diseases when growing up. I had juvenile rheumatoid arthritis and dermatomyositis. Mm. Um, I got it shortly after I had my childhood vaccinations. But they're sitting there going, we don't know what this is. We don't know where this comes from. Well, you know, as an adult, as I'm looking into these things, I, I'm like, well, it, it messes with your immune system. It seems natural that it would be the cause of my autoimmune issues. Um, you know, and then it eventually turned into uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma. So I dealt with children, uh, childhood cancer. So, yeah. <laughs> So here we are, like we're we're worrying about measles and rubella and whatnot, and uh, you know these things are bad, but we've traded that in and now have auto, yeah. you know, chronic illness. And I just cancer. read a story about how Crystal Geyser was dis pled guilty to poisoning water with arsenic. I mean, <laughs> come on. So, yeah, the long term mm -hmm. effects we definitely got to consider those. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 we've gone a long way in our society where we now have a right to not have. Where we assert a right to not get sick from a natural issue, rather than you don't have a right to, rather than it's. Where was my? I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> I hate when this happens. <laughs> we've lost the right to, to control our own bodies. We've right. it's we've surrendered that to the government, and that seems just it seems like a very bad idea long term. Um, so let's we've got the. Libertarian Party State Convention is in a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I hope you guys are both coming. Yeah, I hope absolutely. I get to get there. So <laughs> you might be the best asker. What do libertarians have to look forward to coming in 2020? Oh, I mean, we've got uh, the thing I'm looking most forward to is the uh, presidential debates. <laughs> it should be pretty interesting, especially now that we got Vermin Supreme <laughs> throwing in the boot. <laughs> Um, there's some, um, uh, you know, and then for those who like the, the debates and stuff, we've got uh, quite a few bylaw changes that are being presented, so that, that's going to rile some people up, I'm sure. Um, and then, of course, like, you know, last year we went and deleted the whole, uh, the whole platform. Yeah, I'm on the platform committee this year, so yeah. I, yeah, we, it's, it is, it's going. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, At this going. stage, all I can tell you is it's going. It's yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I've been hearing some some stuff about that from Jill Olson, and uh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, so. it's it's going. Oh, and then I'll be on a I'll be on a panel too. Well, I, what I'd like to heard is we have we, we announced the nominees for the uh, what Carl J. Bray Award, and congratulations, mm -hmm. you were nominated, yeah. and our and our 
local here, Emily Telford, was nominated right. by me. But and <laughs> I, would, I tried to look up a list so I could read the rest of the nominations here, and I couldn't find one. I know it was Judge Gray, um, uh, Boomer John Shannon. John Prosser. Yeah, Boomer Shannon. John Prosser. Mm -hmm. it was, was there, I think there was a couple more people. And I, I, call, I greatly apologize. Ten. I looked before I came on here so I could write them down. Mark Hinkle uh, was another one. Oh, I should have started counting off how <laughs> we've got I so I didn't far. think, I figured I'd be able to pull it off off the website easily later, so I didn't mm -hmm. write them down when I filled out the, the ballot, and I went to go back look and I couldn't find them. So I apologize to all of you, All every single one of you is deserving. <laughs> so you being here today, I want to thank you for all of them, for all of us, for, for all your service that you and everybody who has been nominated yes. for that thank award you. has done. It's, it's greatly appreciated by me, and I'm sure by most of our libertarian viewers. Um, so we've got a couple minutes left. Nicholas, you have a minute to give a closing statement about your campaign. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, what I want to let people know is what we're attempting to do here as libertarians is simply get back to the fundamentals of what our country is supposed to be, a republic, not a democracy, not a dictatorship, <laughs> not an imperialistic country. And uh, that's what I would like to do as the next mayor of Fresno is just give the nation an opportunity to see libertarianism in effect um, in an executive position. Since Fresno is the fifth largest city in California, mm -hmm. given the opportunity to turn the city gold, I think um, more people in the state as well as probably even the country would be inspired to vote libertarian. So um, <laughs> uh, please definitely visit my w website, wildstar2020.com, if you want to find out more about my activism, please visit my other website, governorwildstar.com. Great. Thank you, Nicholas. My pleasure. And Kalish, would you like to give take a minute to tell the viewers, kind of give them a rehash about your campaign? Okay, yeah. I definitely, um, one of the top priorities is deregulation, um, get, making us a more business-friendly environment um, that's going to help make the community thrive. Um, you know, just beyond that, I want to be able to bring a new, um, uh, Creative, creative solutions is really what I bring to the table. I don't like being told, no, we can't do that, because I don't think that it, we have to stay inside that box. Um, and so I, I'm looking forward to stepping in there and bringing forth some different ideas. Great. I want to. I want to thank you guys for being here. This was a great conversation. We got to break our normal our normal fat format, and I appreciate that. It's, it's a. I appreciate you guys coming. Your website is Wildstar2020, and you yes. can be found on Facebook, Kalish Merrow for Hanford City Council, I believe mm -hmm. it was. Yeah. All right. So thank you guys for coming. For information on, on our topics and our, can, our uh, candidates, you can go to our website. I'll put that up on the website, libertariancounterpoint.com. If you're catching us on YouTube, please hit all of the buttons. We greatly appreciate it. You can find us on uh, Instagram and Twitter these days. And from all of us here at Libertarian Counterpoint, we want to thank you for watching, and please remember, to love everybody. everybody.